Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Tough Symposium session on nutrition and diet behavior. My name is Tasia, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's session. Just some housekeeping before we get started. This session is being recorded for potential publishing on our symposium website. So if you do not wish to be recorded, just please modify your name or shut off your camera. Um, but you guys don't have your cameras on, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, um, we also ask that um, if you guys have any questions, um, just put those in the chat. Um, you won't be able to unmute yourself um, when we do our Q&A. So um, just specify which presenter the question is directed towards. And I will um, I'll go through the questions at the end of all of the presentations. Um, and then lastly, we'll be finishing um, the session 10 minutes before the hour just to allow for a short break before the next um, session. So thank you, and we are going to get started. Our first presenter will be Yi Yin Kok with uh, UCSI University in Malaysia. So Yi Yin, whenever you are ready, you can share your screen. All right. Thank you, everyone. So today I'll be presenting the Association of Psychosocial Wellbeing, Sleep Quality, and Sunlight Exposure with Gestational Weight Gain Status Among Pregnant Women in Kuala Lumpur. So for the disclosures, we have no conflicts to disclose for the study. But let me give a brief introduction of our study. So there has been substantial evidence of maternal chronal disruption on the health of their offspring. For example, light, in terms of artificial light, there may be some abnormal exposure to artificial light, which will cause the chronal disruption of the mother. While for sunlight, in a specific sunlight exposure, whereby the sunlight acts as a temporal cue for the circadian rhythm. So when there's an abnormal rhythm of this sunlight exposure, there may be some dysregulation in the circadian rhythm. While for stress or we can say other psychosocial well-being such as depression, stress, or anxiety may have an effect on the mother's emotion and will cause hormonal changes and cause unhealthy habits such as the emotional eating and also eating at night, which is not favorable for our weight gain, especially for the pregnant mothers who will cause unhealthy weight gain status and bring forward these effects to their infants causing microsomia infants or even lead to childhood obesity in the future. So the aim of this study is to determine the association between the psychosocial well-being, sleep, and at sunlight exposure with the total gestational weight gain among the pregnant mothers in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So this is our data collection process. We have collected ethics approval from our medical research ethics committee and also approval from our health officers from Kuala Lumpur and Putrajaya, and we have collected data in government maternity clinics. So we have recruited pregnant women in their second trimester and collected data on their sunlight exposure, sleep quality, and also psychosocial well-being. And then after they have given birth to their infant, we collect their gestational weight gain. And for sunlight exposure, we have used a UV dosimeter, whereby the pregnant mothers are required to wear the patch on their clothing for two weekdays and one weekend. For sleep quality, we have used a validated questionnaire called the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, whereby a score of more than five would indicate a poor sleep quality. While for psychosocial well-being, we have used the depression, anxiety, and stress skills, the 21, 21 items version. So when we compare the association between the sunlight exposure and psychosocial well-being, there was no association found. While for psychosocial well-being, for depression, anxiety, and stress, they were positively correlated with sleep parameters such as subjective sleep quality, sleep disturbance, daytime dysfunction, and also sleep quality. So a higher depression, anxiety, and stress cause will lead to a poorer sleep outcomes. So when we compare the relation when we determine the relationship between psychosocial well-being and also total gestational weight gain, we have found a positive association between depression and total GWG. So this is uh, positive when it is adjusted for sleep quality. So 
It can be explained by emotional eating, whereby it has been reported as a mediator between depression and also weight status, while sleep duration is included as a moderator. So this emotional eating is maybe one of the factors. Other than that, depressed mothers have been reported to have lower physical activity, especially during pregnant mothers, uh, pregnancy. And lastly, this depression itself is some sort of like a lack of willpower. So the depressed mothers requires a lot of self-management to manage their weight and also their emotions during this pregnancy stage. So it may be one of the factors as well. So the key takeaways of this study is that depressive symptoms are associated with the total gestational weight gain during pregnancy. So it may be something to, for us to look into when we are determining other future interventions and also to include sunlight exposure and psychosocial well-being. So although the role of sunlight exposure was not, uh, was not determined in this study, it is still very important as it plays a role in determining the circadian rhythm of the pregnant mothers. So we should look into the role of it in psychosocial well-being and sleep and how it ultimately influenced the total gestational weight gain of the pregnant mothers. So here are the acknowledgements. This study is funded by the UCSI University Research Excellence and Innovation Grant, and the authors are grateful for all pregnant women who participated in this study. Thank you. Thank you, Yian. That was a great presentation. The next presenter we have is Po Zhen Lin with John Hopkins University, the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Whenever you are ready, Po Zhen. Oh, yes. So I can just share my screen. Right. <clears throat> uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Po Jen Lin. Um, I'm a current MPH student at Johns Hopkins. Today, I'm going to introduce our research on the association between home garden use and obesity outcome based on a nationwide survey in Tuvalu. So obesity has become a worldwide crisis as shown by the significant rise in the average BMI um, of the population between 1975 and 2016, noted in this figure. The Oceania region, including Tuvalu, is particularly affected with high prevalence of obesity in many countries. In contrast, home gardens seem to alleviate the obesity pandemic through a social ecological model. They produce benefits um, on participants' physical, mental, and social well-being. And home gardens can provide affordable fresh fruits or vegetables to the local people and increase physical activity. In addition, Past research has identified home gardens as sustainable sources of healthy and affordable food products and exert a positive impact on health awareness as well as community building. So in the fruit and vegetable production and promotion enhancement project carried out by the Taiwan ICDF and the Tuvalu government, we promoted home gardening by providing free seedlings and technical support to transform free land into fertile home gardens. For example, there is a project that built home gardens near the hospital so that the inpatients can have more balanced diet, as you can see from the report of the local newspaper here. So the aim of our study was twofold. Uh, first, to investigate the association between home garden use and obesity in Tuvalu, and second, to explore the factors that predict increased use of home gardens. So here's an outline to our method. We recruited local interviewers to help us conduct in-person interviews in Funafuti, the main island of Tuvalu, and also the eight outlying islands. In each household, one to two adults were selected by convenience sampling and interviewed. We included demographics like um, age, gender, education level, income, and history, medical history of metabolic diseases. In addition, home garden use status and BMI information were also collected. 
And we use um, univariate and multivariate regression as well as overlapping weights as our analytic approach. So our analysis included more than a thousand adults with 630 adults from uh, Funafuti and the other roughly 400 from the outlying islands. In the two regions, home garden owners, home garden owners are older than those with no home gardens, as you can see um, the differences in their age. There were no significant differences in the gender, um, outcome, income, education levels, um, BMI and NCD diagnosis. However, there were fewer daily smokers um, compared to comparing home garden owners and uh, no home garden owners in Funafuti. But we did not identify significant demographic differences between um, home garden owners and non-home garden owners among the participants across the outlying islands. So here comes um, the regression on the obesity. There was no significant association between obesity and home garden ownership, either before or after adjusting for potential confounders or in the weight model. But meanwhile, there was an inverse association between home, home garden ownership and severe obesity in the um, overlap weight model and um, the unadjusted model and fully adjusted model had their confidence interval cross and null. So obesity means BMI over 30, but severe obesity means BMI over 40. And we further stratified the study population into um, Funafuti participants and also um, the, the outlying islands participants to examine their um, stratified association. So we found that there is no association between uh, home garden ownership and obesity either in Funafuti or the outlying islands. But at the same time, we observed the in inverse association between home garden ownership and severe obesity in Funafuti, but not um, among people in the outlying islands. So for the prediction for home garden use, we found that for residents in Funafuti, current smokers were less likely to have a home garden in their families while people aged 60 to 70 years were more likely to own a home garden than their younger counterparts. In contrast, home garden ownership was not associated with um, gender of interviewee, education, income, non-communicable disease diagnosis, and other included demographic factors among participants in the outlying islands. So our study provides evidence that home garden ownership is associated with lower odds for severe obesity in Tuvalu. But after stratifying participants by their resident, we found that such association was observed in Funafuti, but not the outlying islands. Furthermore, in Funafuti, increased age may be a positive predictive factor while being a current smoker seemed to be inversely associated with home garden utilization. So we envision home garden as a supplement to provide affordable products and a vessel to promote health behaviors, but the implementation requires tailored approaches considering the characteristics of each island. And finally, we provide some possible explanations for our findings. Traditionally, people in Tuvalu, like other Pacific Islanders, rely on their agroforestry and fishery resources to create sustainable systems which met their daily dietary needs throughout their lives. But compared to Funafuti, where there are much higher levels of urbanization, people in the outlying islands preserve most of the original lifestyles and the additional benefits of home gardening under such circumstances may become less prominent. Okay, so uh, um, this is my references. Thanks for listening to the presentation. Thank you, Po Zhen. The next presenter we have is going to be Or Avishai with Hebrew University. So, Or, whenever you are ready, you can share your slides. Thank you. Okay. 
So, hi everyone, my name is Ori Shai, and I'm doing a master's degree in biochemistry, food science, and nutrition at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel. And my study is about the consumer response to front of package food labeling in Israel. I have no conflicts to disclose. And I don't need to elaborate about the rise in obesity rates worldwide and that there needs to, we need to find a solution not only at the individual level, but on the population level. And one solution that is encouraged by the WHO, the World Health Organization, is front of package nutrition labeling that is supposed to inform the consumers and provide um, important nutritional information at the front of the package. And it's also supposed to, um, to, to encourage the industry to reformulate its product into healthier products. And indeed, in Israel, in July 2020, this uh, kind of reform was implemented. We have three mandatory red labels, one for high sugar, high, sh high sodium, and high saturated fat, and one healthy vo uh, voluntary label, uh, green label for minimally processed foods. And there are other countries who have um, similar kinds of labels and different kinds of labels. But the problem is that most studies evaluating these labels, the, fr the front of package nutrition labeling, are based on self-reported subjective surveys. And there are not much, there's a lack of objective studies evaluating the consumer's attention to the front of package nutrition labeling. So if we want to, to see what objective measure we can use, first we need to understand how can a consumer uh, make a, a, an informed decision using the labels. So first, the consumer must see the label because if he doesn't see the label, it can't influence him. After that, he interprets the label. He can interpret it as high in sugar or as very, very delicious. And then he makes his choice, a healthy, red, um, healthy green label product or a less healthy um, red label product. And this eventually, of course, is, affects his eating. Another thing that comes into this scheme is his prior beliefs and preferences, which affects both his, his interpretation of the message, because if he doesn't trust the Ministry of Health in Israel, he may disregard the label. And it also affects his visual attention, because if he cares about his health, he may actively look more uh, and search for the red labels. So an objective measure we have here, we can actually measure the visual attention of the consumers. We can do that using eye tracking glasses and see if the consumer fixated on the label or not. And these are the eye tracking glasses that we used in our experiment. All the dots that you see here are cameras and they capture like the exact gaze of the consumer at every given point of time in his, uh, in his shopping uh, trip. And this information is valuable because attention and engagement are found to be closely related to eye movements. And I must say that there are studies using eye tracking technology to evaluate the labels, but most studies were done in the lab, which doesn't represent the real behavior in the supermarket, in the real world environment. So let's quickly go through our aims. We wanted to first analyze consumer perception and visual attention to the front of package nutrition labeling. And then we wanted to compare objective eye tracking data with the subjective self-reported attention of the participants. So what we did, we first recruited 20 participants uh, to the supermarket. We calibrated uh, the eye tracking glasses on them. And while wearing the glasses, we asked them to choose uh, a product they would like to buy in four different food categories. Then after they chose, they filled a self-report questionnaire. So we measured their visual attention, their choice, and also their prior belief and preferences. And now I want to show you a video of uh, how an eye, an eye tracking video looks like. And you can see that the red dot is a fixation. And the bigger the dot, the longer the fixation. And see if you can see if he fixated on the label here. So he did fixate on the label, if you got a chance to see, a few times. And it, the, the fixations on the label are relatively short, as you saw. On average, fixations on the label were one second. But I must say that this isn't necessarily bad because maybe the labels are doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Maybe they're very quick and easy to understand. So now I want to go through some results. Um, what you see right now is the percent of people who fixated on the labels at least one time, meaning they saw the labels. So in cereal category, a third of the participants, only third, saw the, the label. And in beverages, half of the participants saw the label. And now I'm going to show you the percent of the participants who reported seeing the label. So you can see the big gap here between the self-report of the participant and the, the actual eye tracking data that we know who saw the labels. And also only 50% of the participants correctly remember the label type. And the only label type they remember was sugar. And remember, we have a, a label for sugar, fat, saturated fat, and sodium. 
One thing that can explain the low percent of people viewing the labels is that people said that they know, some people said that they know that there was, was a label on the product they chose, but they didn't look at it. Because after all, we've done this study two years after the reform implementation. So some people already know that the product they're choosing has a red label and they don't need to look at the label for it to uh, affect them. And then we wanted to check the, the recall accuracy for the labeled product. And we saw that 50% of the participants who said that they saw the label didn't actually fixate on the label. And the 37% of the people who said that they did not see the label actually did fixate on the label. And overall, 25% of the participants said that there was a, a label on an absolutely unlabeled product. We, and so again, we can see this gap. So our key takeaways are first that um, using eye tracking uh, in the field, in the supermarkets, it's a, it's a viable tool to, ev to evaluate whether the assumption that front of package nutrition labeling informs choices at the point of purchase, of, of purchase is true. Then we, we saw that only a small percentage had the opportunity to use the labels to make an informed decision. And again, we saw the big gap, the big uh, mismatch between objective and self-reported visual attention to the labels, which emphasizes the fact that surveys are not a sufficient tool to measure consumer behavior and that objective data is necessary. And we also had a way to quantify the effect of self-reporting bias and consumer error, as you saw. So overall, this was the first study to measure the informed choice of consumer in a holistic way, both their visual attention, their, their behavior, uh, and their attitudes and preferences. And this sets the stage for more comprehensive eye tracking field studies to understand the psychological mechanism through which front of package labeling influence healthy food choices. And this will provide a sound evidence base for policy development and refinement. And we are now analyzing a full scale study that we are doing in order to correlate the attention to choice and preferences. And this type of uh, studies produce a, lot, um, a, a large amount of data uh, so there's much more to, to, to uh, get done. And if anyone would be happy to collaborate, and this is my email. Thank you all for your attention. And thank you, thank you to everyone who took part of this study. Very good. Thank you, Or. The next presenter will be Chifu Wee with the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. So Chifu, whenever you are ready to share your screen, you may do so. Okay, so hello everyone, I'm Chifu Wei, and I'm currently a PhD candidate from Harvard School of Public Health, Chan School of Public Health, and today I'm going to share with you the proportion of obesity in a community-based behavior and attitude, so-called combat survey in Tuvari. It is a nationwide cross-sectional study during 2020 and 2022, and below are the collaborators, and we don't have conflict of interest to disclose. So as for Tuvalu, our, the place of our study, it faced triple threat in this Atlantic country. Tuvalu faces a triple threat of climate change, food insecurity, and a severe obesity pandemic. The ability of fruits, availability of fruits and vegetables is limited by the soil salinization due to the elevated sea levels and its changing climate. As we can see in the plot above, there is an increased sea levels during the past decades. At the same time, the food insecurity goes up, so they have to rely more on the imported foods, which leads to the obesity pandemic of an increased prevalence of obesity during the past decades. And this issue goes more in the during the COVID pandemic. So we have collaborated with the local government and the local team to initiate the combat study to investigate not only the proportion of obesity in Tuvalu, but also the context of obesity pandemic in this Atlantic country, with regards to the nutrition knowledge, agro agroecological attitudes towards food and health and their di local dietary patterns and the trends of metabolic health during 2020 and 2022. And Pete Poland has just presented about our prelim preliminary results for home gardening and obesity. So this is an international 
collaboration between across the ocean in both Tuvalu, Taiwan, and in the U.S. And we had the great fortune to collaborate with a fantastic local team to survey all across the Tuvalu. In 2020, we conducted a survey in the Funafuti, which is the main island. And we also reached out to the two major high schools, Fetuvaru and Motufoa High School. We surveyed 370 adults and 180 high school students before and during the initial state of COVID. And in 2022, we resumed the second wave of survey. We expanded the survey to the whole country, to the eight other islands. In this wave, we include 1,030 adults and 102 high school students. We use in-person interview and physical examination. We recorded several battery of results, including their nutrition knowledge, attitude, dietary pattern based on the food frequency questionnaires discussed with local dietitians. Also, we gather the ge geographic information of their residents and their birthplace, so we are able to link to the climate data. So this is a study conducted at, under the approval of the Tuvalu Ministry of Health and the trained interviewers get a consent before the initiation of the study procedures. And in this slide, I wish to share with you the demographic of the study population. As we can see, as the adult, for the adult populations, we are focusing more on the middle age population and uh, most of them, more of them are females. And we've compared the demographic between 2020 and 2022. We found there's a higher percentage of alcohol consumption, smoking, and interesting, there's an increased prevalence of exercise. And at the same time, we found a, unemployment goes up in 2022. As for the BMI, the two waves of BMI, average BMI were 34.2 and 34.9. Both of them are way above the definition of obesity, which is also seen in the data column that there is a 73% of obesity prevalence in Tuvalu. And at the same time, we also invest, investigate the two major high school in Tuvalu. We found the, in general, the BMI were around 26, and there is a, around 20 to 28% of prevalence of obesity. And the, we found an increase with circumference in the 2022 population than our 2020 population, which is a trend of concern. As for the intake change, we found in, that there is a less sweetened beverage consumption for the adults. But at the same time, we found more adults in the 2022 cohort take intake more instant noodles. As for adolescents, the overall percentage was distribution were similar for rice and fish. But for the sweetened beverage, we can see a very bipartite trend in the, in the 2022 population, like less of them take several times a week, but the prevalence of taking it many, almost every day increase in this population. So we are initiating the 2023 survey in the two high school to investigate this trend of sweet and beverage consumption. And for the last one to two minutes, I wish to share with you a discussion. So at in our study, we found an increased mean BMI from the previous study in 1981 to a 34.2 kilogram per square meter, which is a fast increase. And we also find an increased percentage of highway circumference among adolescents, which is a trend of concern. And we found that COVID-19 pandemic does has a role in the dietary habits and behavior. Adults seek out more food for longer storage duration, like instant noodles. And there is an increased alcohol consumption and cigarette use, which is a social behavior 
difference of concern and which can affect the nutrition status. And overall, it showed that high proportion of obesity actually reflect a multifactorial cause of obesity in Tuvalu and it warrants further study to achieve for achievable sustainable lifestyle changes and cultural centered interventions. So there are several strengths and limitations. Like the, we have the first in depth study with comprehensive population specific data collection, but it's cross sectional with recall and social desirability bias. And we have a limited number of conclusions. But in conclusion, our study provides the evidence for a high proportion of obesity and changes in food intakes, social demographic factors in Tuvalu during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is an understudy population with high susceptibility to obesity pandemic. And our study provides a strong foundation for future investigation in Tuvalu to understand, to combat the triple threat of climate change, food insecurity, and the obesity pandemic in this country. So, Thanks a lot for your attention. Okay. Thank you, Chifu. Very good presentation. The last per, uh, presenter of today's session will be uh, Barbara Anianu with um, Michael Akapara, University of Agriculture. So Barbara, um, you can share your screen for us, please. And also unmute yourself. You are muted. I am now. Okay, we can hear you now. Oh, thank you. So it's like showing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is the slide show? Okay, thank you. My name is Onyango Barbara Abinchinobi from the Department of Methodology and Investor of Agriculture, Abia State. And my presentation is on the dietary practice anthropometric status of certain pregnant adolescents in Abia State. There was no conflict. There was no conflict, so there's nothing to disclose. The background of our work was based on the stigma that is associated with adolescent pregnancy in this part of the world. There is a lot of stigmatization of, of involved with um, seeing in adolescent pregnancy, and especially because most of them are not married and there is a lot of um, discrimination among them at that point. So we tried to determine their, this work was done to determine their food habits, their dietary practice and their anthropometric status. And we used Abia State Nigeria as a case study that was where this um, survey was conducted. So we collected this data using about 137 adolescents who were attending um, prenatal care at some health care centers in Abia State Nigeria, and this was a cross-sectional survey and they were randomly selected. The data was collected using a, a question, yeah, and then we used the Institute of Medicine recommendation to classify their gestational risk gain. The results of our survey showed that the majority of them were buying food, and this is common among students because there is always a complaint that there is no, that they don't have enough time to, to, to cook because they leave for lectures early in the morning and they come back um, late in the evening. So there is always a lot of complaint about not having time to cook food. So this is reflected in the results where you see that the majority of them are buying food. And then more than half of them are, eat, uh, more than half of them eat three times a day. And obviously during pregnancy, there is an increase in appetite. And also when they are adolescent, there is also a higher increase in appetite. So this is reflected there. Now, majority of them we are, did not skip meal. And this is not surprising as well because of there was high, because at both adolescence and pregnancy, there is always increase in appetite. So this can be seen in this um, results. And the majority of them also um, consumed them in between, um, more than half of them consumed in between meals. 
So you can see that there. Now, you can also see that almost half of them um, avoided fish during pregnancy. Now, this is because in Nigeria, especially in the Ubo culture, there is a lot of, and there are a lot of restrictions to the type of diet a pregnant woman can take. And there is this restriction is mostly seen in um, proteinous food. So this is seen here that there are a lot of taboos as, um, associated with consumption of proteinous food using fish and it, as an example. And this is seen that almost half of them are avoiding fish because of the things that were told to them that could happen to them when that they, when they consume food. Something maybe um something that will happen to their child when they give birth to them. Such a, and so this is seen here. Now we can also see that majority of them we are consuming um, fruits and vegetables during this pregnancy. And this shows that this is usually emphasized in our prenatal classes. So this and we can see that they we are listening well during their uh, uh, prenatal classes. So this is reflected there. And also because of the high rate of constipation that is seen during pregnancy, the we know, uh, fruits and vegetables helps to reduce um, constipation. So that could also explain why a majority of them are also consuming um, fruits and vegetables. And you see that majority, um, many of them consume um, fruits more than three times a day, and others also consume vegetables daily. Now, um, about majority of them drank three to five glasses of water, and this is a low rate of consumption of water. And then the snacks, which they con more than half of them, um, almost half of them consumed um soft drink as in between you this is because it's highly accessible in the place in this part of the world and this is also very affordable so this could explain why almost half of them we are consuming snack we are consuming um carbonated drink as and even most of them had no weight gain now and about a quarter gained um optimal had optimal weight gain now remember that this was this categorization was done using the IMO recommendation for the stationary weight gain. So this is what we can see there. And then there, we also observed a significant relationship between their gestational weight gain and their frequency of consumption of fruits and snacks. And this is obvious because the food you eat also reflects in your weight gain. So food and drinks um, reflects in weight gain. So this, so this shows this can be seen in the relationship between the this can be seen in the relationship the key takeaway of our work is that the um, there should be more nutritional education for these adolescents do you, because when they attend at um, prenatal classes they go in the midst of married women and then the nurses and other healthcare providers are usually married or grown people so because of that there are a lot of um, stigmatization associated with adolescent pregnancy because the majority of them are not married. So they don't usually have enough courage to ask questions during this, during the antenatal classes. So and um, when they go, whatever they are being told, they just listen, they don't get the right, they might not get the right information pertaining to them as adolescents because you know that at that stage, at adolescents, there is a high nutrient, there is a high nutritional need for them. And also with pregnancy, the nutrient nutritional need for them is higher. So this could explain why most um, because maybe they don't have the courage to ask questions during the during the prenatal classes. And also the prenatal classes are tailored towards adults. It is not tailored towards adolescents. So whatever they are being taught is for adults. So they don't, those who are who are given the prenatal classes don't um take part and don't put that of the adolescents in mind. They teach them based on what the adults require. And we know that the nutritional needs of adolescents is higher. So they don't put that in mind by teaching them. So that is why they follow basically the ad the advice given for the adults. So this might be the reason why they, we are not getting the appropriate way to get required for them. And then there we need we need to reorient those who are teaching them. Because of the stigmatization that is um, seen in adolescent pregnancy, that is why they don't have the courage to ask the questions which they need to ask. 
So the, the nurses, the healthcare workers, the doctors have to be oriented as well because they are also part of the people who stigma, who discriminate among them. So maybe when they want to ask questions, they could make them certain nasty comments which will not give them the courage to keep on asking questions so that they can get the right information. They just listen to what is being told to them and they go so that they don't even want to be noticed. So this is one of the challenges that they face as adolescents. So there, there needs to be orientation, both for the healthcare workers and also for those around them, so that they can also have the courage to go to these um, permanent healthcare centers. And then I think also the education, the and the prenatal classes has to be tailored more towards them and also for the adults. There needs to be two um, different classes so that they can be taught for the one that will suit their needs and also for the adults so that they can gain a lot. I would like to thank the Department of Human Nutrition at Michael Lockwood University of Agriculture. So as this, uh, they were those, they are the people who contributed to the success of this work and in a special way to the head of the department, Professor Mrs. Onsalabu and then um, Dr. Um, Mr. Ihe Megiddo, which are the supervisors of this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara, and thank you everyone um, today who presented. They were wonderful presentations. We have um, whenever, uh, yeah, thank you, Barbara. Um, we have a few questions. Um, I just asked that um, the answers just are uh, brief so we can try to get through all of them because we only have about eight minutes. Um, so the first question was for um, Yi Yin, um, the first presenter. Um, the question was, are there associations between depression and excessive gestational weight gain in your study's population? Yes, thank you for that question. So in our study, depression was not associated with excessive gestational weight gain, but only a positive association between depression and gestational weight gain itself. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The next um, question is for Pojen. Um, there's actually a few, a couple. Um, I'm going to just pull out two of them. So one of the um, questions is that could communal rather than private gardens be used as an intervention? Um, and then the next question is how would you tailor um, home garden and home garden intervention? Oh uh, yes, thanks. Thanks for the question. So actually, in Tuvalu, we have home gardens and also the communal gardens. We call it the government gardens, and also we we assess the benefits associated with these two kinds of gardens. But for the communal gardens, we did not observe um, either uh, association between um, the use and also the decreased obesity or severe obesity. So what we think is that um, private gardens or home gardens may provide more com uh, comprehensive benefits, including affordable um, vegetables, and it also provides physical activities and also some men mental benefits, um, which the communal gardens may not be able to address. And um, how do we tailor to how do we tailor um, home garden interventions in different islands in Tuvalu? So um, I think we can approach these questions in several ways. First, we can assess the ecological conditions on, on each island, including the rainfalls, because um, rainfall is very important. It's a critical part for agricultural extension. So we have to assess um, the uh, rainfall conditions in each island and also the demographic conditions like the population density. So um, it, it will all affect um, our decision on how we how we carry out a home, home garden project in these islands. Thank you, Pojan. Um, or I have a quick question for you. Um, you know, this is a pilot study. So um, based on that, where do you see future research going with this? And how can this study, you know, really help us with label changes? Global changes? Oh, this is this is for OR. So, sorry? This question is for OR. Oh. Okay, yeah. Um, so if I can share my screen again. Um, so the next thing we're doing is a larger study. Um, and we, we and here we're not only measuring 
how many people looked at the red label. And also we're also uh, measuring correlations with their choice. It does looking at the label make you choose healthier products and with their attitudes. If they say, if they say that they use the labels, do they actually use the labels? Um, so that we can know if, if the policy in Israel works. And also another thing that we want to do is we, during our study, we saw all those labels and they're very, very similar to the official label of the Ministry of Health, the green label I showed you, but they're not the official label. Uh, and we're concerned that these label may be um, overloading the, the visual attention and maybe distracting from the official labels. So we are going to do an eye tracking study in a lab to see if these label are, are uh, distracting the attention. Um, and also we're going to, to go through all the, all the products uh, in Israel and see how many products have these kinds of labels and to see the, the, the scope of this phenomenon. If that answers your question. Yeah, that's very good, thank you. Um, and then next question is for Chief Chifu um, from Aaron. Um, they said it looked like the last survey showed a significant portion proportion of people currently um, never drinking drinks, but in the earlier survey, fewer people never drank uh, sugar sweetened beverages. Is this correct? What is the reason for the decline in sugar sweetened beverages? Yeah, so I think, thanks a lot for the question from Aaron. It's a really nice one. And I think one of the reasons is because the federal government has implemented the sugar tax in, during the year 2020. So there is a decrease in sugar beverage. Cons there might be one of the explanation for sugar beverage consumption. And there is an actually an interesting topic of our future surveys in 2023 is whether this sugar tax has a beneficial effect on the other lessons because we've, we haven't seen a drastic difference, but that is one of the topic of interest in our next wave of survey. And we look forward to update with you on the results in the coming next conference, next symposium. <laughs> yeah, so I, I hope that helps. Yes, thank you, Shifu. And then, um, Barbara, the last question for you is, I just want to hear, I think, and we all would love to hear just how you got involved with this research. It's very fascinating. Okay, well, it's, like I said, for adolescents, um, pregnancies and pregnancy, uh, um, pregnancy during adolescence is something that they really stigmatize in the country. So because of that, and there are still lots of pregnant adolescents in the country in as much as, in as, much as their stigmatization. So, and then some of them don't really get the care that they need. So that's really um, increased my curiosity about it. So that was what um, made me to choose it as um, a project. So which we tried to collect the data and find out because of the, it was mainly the stigmatization that is associated with, uh, with um, pregnancy during adolescence and also um, pre-marital pre pre pregnancy. So that was really what drew my attention to the problem. Very good. Thank you, Barbara, for sharing that. I just want to thank everyone, all of our presenters. They were wonderful presentations today. Um, and then I want to thank all of like everyone for coming and watching. Um, we hope to see you in the next couple of sessions later on um, today. So um, yeah, thank you everyone. And um, we will hopefully see you later. <laughs>